Hello and welcome to Nemo's webinar on cross-border cooperation that will give an update on our toolkit from 2021 and explain possibilities of the Erasmus+. Plus. My name is Rebecca and I work as the communications officer at Nemo. And as the, Euro as the network of European museum organizations, our main activities include advocating for museums at EU level, providing training opportunities such as this webinar, providing a platform for museums to exchange and learn from each other, and helping museums to cooperate across borders. And in connection to that, we are very happy to have you with us here today from across Europe and the world as we present today's webinar, facilitated by Margarita Sani and Evelyn Kaindo Luhantzinga. And applying for EU funding can seem complicated and overwhelming, and we want to empower museums to fully benefit from the opportunities offered by EU programs. And therefore, we published a, a toolkit a few years ago. And with that toolkit as a starting point, we will describe recent updates of programs such as Horizon Europe and Creative Europe. Marcus, Margarita Sani is the author of the toolkit and an expert when it comes to the EU jungle. And Margarita will later be in dialogue with Evelyn Kaino Hansinger, the senior officer at the Styrian Museums organization, MUSES, in Austria, to understand how small institutions can ben benefit from different possibilities offered by Erasmus. Plus. At the end of this webinar, uh, you will have the opportunity to ask questions in the QA round using the chat function. And now, there, Margarita and Evelyn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rebecca. And here we go. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we will start, in fact, as Rebecca was saying, we start from here, from the Cross-Border Cooperation for Museums Toolkit, which you can Google, which you can find online, which you can download, and I invite you to do so. It was produced, as Rebecca was mentioning, actually at the end, it was finalized at the end of 2020, published in early 2021. And it was a response from Nemo uh, to the problem which had been evident after uh, Nemo's research that only a few museums in Europe, not enough museums in Europe, are using European funds. So it was thought as a sort of like a support and encouragement uh, to museums to be more active uh, in, that, in that respect. Um, so the, the toolkit itself is meant to be a step-by-step -step guide to uh, take you by the hand and lead you through, um, Rebecca was saying, the jungle, let's say the complex field of, of European uh, projects. Um, I'm showing you here the, the table of contents and focusing on the core of the, um, of the toolkit. So these steps that you have to take in order to, um, to write an application, to understand how European funds work, to find partners and so on. Let's look at them in more detail. So first of all, uh, organizational check. What do you have to do? Uh, you have to, to look at your organization, see if you have the, um, the financial and the um, human capacity uh, to, to tackle a European project. If uh, working internationally is in the mission of your organization, of course, if you are, uh, if you're not the director, you have to check with your boss whether that would be, it would be interesting to, um, to take part or to lead a European project. So a bit of an organizational check of what you can or cannot do or what is useful or not useful for your organization must be done uh, and also a check on whether you already have connections at European or international levels if you're part of a network and so on because uh, being part of a network is the second must be um, being part or having a network of contact uh, this is because, of course, uh, a European project can only be done in partnership. The minimum required number of um, organizations for a European project, uh, the very minimum is three, three organizations from three different countries. And so it is important to have a network. And how do you build a network if you have none? Nemo, this is also, uh, this, this infographic is also in the toolkit. I mean, there are many ways of doing so. Um, and you can start easy by attending international conference, conferences and workshops or events, participating in study visits or study exchanges. All these two opportunities are offered uh, by NEMO to NEMO members. Um, you can attend uh, events um, in another country. You can travel to another country. Um, and, and also, which is 
very useful, I think, start by being a, a minor partner or an associate partner in an EU-funded project. That will give you first-hand um, experience on how uh, a European project works. And then, of course, uh, you, um, you develop an idea or an idea comes to mind, sort of like that, bright idea. Uh, but then having an idea is not sufficient. And we will go back to this in a second. It's not sufficient, uh, but when you have an idea, you also start looking for funds. And this is what we're getting into in a moment. What European funds are available for museum projects, for cultural heritage projects. Um, I was saying, um, it is important to, to look at the funding sources and to understand uh, what can be funded by European funds, because this is, if anything of this webinar, please remember this, that Europe does not fund projects, but finances its policies through projects which means that you might have the brightest idea, but if this idea does not match with European priorities, so with European policies, uh, you don't stand a chance to be funded because basically Europe uh, pursues its objectives, um, its policies, and it is through these projects, uh, through the projective funds, that it, it tries to achieve its aims. So your project must be uh, must be in line with the uh, with the European uh, priorities and uh, objectives. And so, in fact, developing a project idea, having a, a project idea is not sufficient, but developing a project idea must, as I was saying, be in line with the organization's mission and objectives. And this is very important. You, can, you cannot develop a project which is completely detached from your organization, which I mean, you feel that doesn't bring you anything because it is extra work, it is extra effort. In terms of money, it is, the money is probably just enough to achieve the, activ the activities uh, or, or that the project um, uh, lists, say, in the, in the application. So it really has to be useful also for your organization. I mean, you have to go a bit out of your way. It cannot be something that it is only useful for your organization. Otherwise, there would be no reason for uh, embarking on a European in a, new, in a European project. But it has to sort of, I always say, uh, you have to keep a balance, a balance between what is useful for you, what is useful for your partners, and what is important for the EU. Uh, a good project uh, stems from an analysis of needs and an analysis of the context, because you really have to explain it also in the application why you decided to embark on this project. Um, it has to resonate with interests and priorities of peer organizations in other countries, so it has to um, in, in a way, be in line with your own organization, uh, but also with uh, the, the, the aims and objectives of um, the, the partners. Otherwise, they don't see a reason for joining you in the partnership. It has in, uh, to be in line with the priorities of the funding program, as I was saying. It has to have an international value. One of the typical questions in the uh, EU application is, uh, what is the European added value? And this is simply so because there are many ways of funding a project. And, and, and maybe before uh, turning to European funds, you should look at whether your project uh, is, fun, is uh, whether it's possible to fund your project at a local level, at national level. But if you decide to go for European funds, then you have to show and to give evidence of the fact that this idea is important for Europe at European level. And also very difficult to achieve normally, uh, the project should be sustainable after the completion, after the end of the funding period. And this is again a typical question, what's going to happen to the project after the EU funding ends? And it is important to think already ahead of how you want to keep it alive. Uh, the toolkit is providing you with lots of uh, ideas uh, on how to do this, uh, on how to study the context, um, on how to identify the target groups and the other stakeholders, on how to identify the potential partners, and also how to uh, detail the project, uh, on how to detail it into project activities, into outputs, 
also called deliverables, because the other thing you, you have to learn is that uh, there is a jargon, there is a, an EU jargon, uh, which is important to get familiar with. Um, and, and also uh, drafting, uh, along with a, with a work plan, drafting a, a risk management plan. What risks will this project present and which mitigation measures can be imagined? Um, this is a visual uh, help to see how the project uh, normally unfolds. You have to um, think of activities, think of outcomes, of times, and all of these can vary uh, sub-activities, and all of this has to be costed, of course, and this can also be visualized with the Gantt chart, this bar, bar chart that shows how the project unfolds over time, um, and again, all this is is in the in the in the toolkit. But don't worry because the application forms themselves uh, help you uh, think in a very structured way. So it is probably just enough. I mean, the toolkit is useful, of course, to to anticipate what's coming. But just by following the the questions in the application form, you will be forced to think ahead, to plan forward, to imagine even the smallest details of the project, because all that you are declaring in the application form is becoming your contract. When you say you don't sign a contract, by the way, you don't even sign a contract, but you sign an agreement with the, uh, with the commission or with the uh, agency that is in charge of dealing with all the administrative aspects of, of the EU funds. Uh, but what you, so what you write is binding. So you better think ahead and, and think in depth of what you want to achieve and how you want to achieve it and how much money you need for that. So the project idea is described in terms of ob objectives, of beneficiaries and target groups, of activities, well detailed, well cost um, costed um, outputs, which are the deliverables, so the, the products, the short term products or outcomes, which are the long term uh, products. Uh, to give you an example, an output in a project could be uh, you, within your project, you are uh, delivering a training course, and that's the output. The training course itself, it's an output. The outcomes is to provide uh, the uh, beneficiaries of those um, training, of that training with skills that will be useful for them in the long run, in the medium long run. Of course, you have to think of the partners and, and of the budget. So all this is in the project idea. Um, and then you write the application. And again, here in the toolkit, there are lots of tips to, 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 to do so. Uh, but, um, and, and so far for the toolkit, I mean, you will find it all there. Uh, you will also find at the end of it uh, a glossary. So terms that we just uh, you know, encountered briefly during this conversation already, like, uh, um, like the gun chart, like the milestones, like uh, um, outputs, outcomes, deliverables, they, they are all there. So the objective this morning is that of not only recapping uh, what, is in the, uh, what is in the toolkit, but um, having a, a quick look of what is new, of some of the new features of the, uh, of the new funding period. As you know, Europe, um, every seven years, there is a new funding period, so new programs with sometimes uh, new features and, and new priorities. So when the toolkit was, was um, finalized at the end of 2020, some of these uh, programs, most of them, were not there because the new funding program that we are in is 2021-2027. So uh, it was not possible to include um, these new aspects in, in the toolkit. So what is new? Well, first of all, uh, some new resources are there to help you. And this is, for me, the most important entry point to European funding, the funding and tender portal. Uh, and this is, as you see, and I'm showing you better here, you have a list of all the programs available. You click on them and you're sent to the web page of that program with all the details. Uh, you can also um, look um, at which calls are open. 
So the search uh, funding and tenders functionality is also very useful. You can uh, you know, uh, see if there is an open call for Creative Europe or Rasmus Plus or any other of the, uh, of the programs that are listed. Um, it also supports you in participating. So it is, in a way, it, it's doing a bit what the, the toolkit does. It gives you a step-by-step -step help to, uh, to, to, to decide and to find out how to find a suitable call for proposals. So again, how to match your idea with the call, how to find partners. There's also a search, um, a partner search functionality which is useful, although I would not uh, recommend to rely only on that because it is very important to, um, to know your partners or at least uh, some of them when you start. Um, I mean, of course, there can always be new newcomers, but it's good to start with a good partnership, reliable partnership. So, and we're back. So to what we were saying when mentioning the building of a network as an essential element. And then it leads you through uh, actually, you know, the basics, creating a, a, an EU login account because you do have to create your own profile uh, if you want to participate in EU uh, projects, whether as a partner or whether as a, co uh, as a coordinator. Okay. And then you can also uh, look at projects and results, uh, which means um, that you can uh, browse through the, the projects that were already uh, funded and uh, to have an idea of what was uh, already financed and, and to sort of like gather new uh, input and, and suggestions. And there is a lot uh, also in terms of support, uh, guidance and manuals, list of frequently asked questions, the help desk and support services, support videos. So there is quite a bit. Um, the webinars that are regularly delivered when there's a new call, um, they are also um, to be found here. So even if you cannot attend, uh, online, you can always retrieve these uh, good and useful supporting um, supporting tools. Uh, another important resource that was not there before is this Cultural EU Funding Guide. We will go back to it in a moment. I'm just browsing the website with you for a second uh, to show you what is there. We were saying it is important to be familiar with European policies because you have to uh, be in line. Your project has to be in line with European uh, priorities and policies. So here, when you click on the Policies tab, it opens up all this um, say list of uh, relevant uh, documents that you can um, access and that you uh, that help you become more familiar with uh, with European uh, policies. Or um, if you want to look at um, cultural heritage, if you're interested in in, in cultural heritage, how it is. Uh, considered in uh, in European policies, here you have this this other tab, or um, uh, Creative Europe, which is one of the most important, uh, Europe, uh, best known European uh, programs for culture. There's more detail on Creative Europe. And um, going back to the guide and why it is important. Uh, the guide is important. This is the guide. I find it a very uh, useful resource for starting. And again, this is brand new for 2021, 2027. I'm showing you the table of contents. And here from the table of contents, you already see that it does not focus only on the you know, uh, typical Creative Europe, Erasmus Plus, um, or other project uh, or other EU programs that we are familiar with, but it lists uh, 20 European programs that can fund the cultural projects. So it's very, very important to look at them, at least to be aware that uh, in, there is much more competition, of course, for uh, cultural projects within the uh, cultural programs, but maybe in programs on, on uh, I don't know, um, European, uh, say, um, what is it, uh, European Solidarity Corps or Asylum Migration and Integration Fund. Maybe not, there, there, is not, there will not be such a competition uh, for cultural projects and you, your project might stand a better chance to be funded. 
in the um, cultural EU funding guide, you also find, which I find uh, very, very useful, a list of case studies. Again, and a list of case studies that uh, relate to different of these uh, funding programs. Um, and not the usual ones, so to say. So uh, again, you can be, you can read, you can be inspired. Uh, let's look uh, more in detail to three of these funding programs, which are the most, uh, the ones that, that cultural institutions normally turn to. One is Horizon Europe, um, which succeeded Horizon 2020, and which is the, the research program for Europe in all fields, as you see, uh, one, two, three pillars, they cover all uh, areas. Uh, and, and for the first time uh, in 2021, uh, so in the funding uh, period 2021-2027, uh, more prominence was given to cultural creativity and inclusive society. So uh, there are you know, more opportunities uh, for uh, cultural pro uh, projects to be funded here. I'm just um, showing you, and I know it's a bit blurry, the list of, um, of, of calls that are contained into the Horizon Europe uh, Work Program 2023-2024 under the strand Cultural Creativity and Inclusive Society. Uh, for instance, Advanced Technologies for Remote Monitoring of Heritage Monuments and Artifacts, Cultural and Creative Industries for a Sustainable Climate Transition, Revisiting the Digitization of Cultural Heritage, Cultural Heritage in Transformation Facing Change with Conflict, Confidence, fostering socioeconomic development and job creation in rural and remote areas through cultural tourism, and so on and so forth. So um, the only thing is that Horizon Europe being the research program and giving big money because the projects funded are funded for at least 1 million euro. So it's not a normal budget for a year, for an, uh, an Horizon Europe project is one, two millions, sometimes even more. The only point is that uh, big organizations and normally universities go for it. So you might find your place here um, as a small organization or uh, as a partner if you are um, if you're asked to, 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 to take part. I would say um, as a museum, maybe if you are a large museum or a large research organization, you could lead lead uh, an Horizon Europe uh, project, but otherwise it's better to find your place as a small, uh, as a small partner within these partnerships. Uh, what is new in Horizon Europe uh, that was not there before? I'm mentioning this call, new ways of participatory management and sustainable financing of museums and other cultural institutions. Because, uh, and I quote, um, it, it says, uh, proposals are encouraged to include close, close interaction with local, regional, and national communities and authorities, as well as cooperation with research institutions and the cultural and creative stakeholders. So there's already an invitation to include smaller organizations in the project. And <clears throat> I could not retrieve a, a, a previous call, also an Horizon um, Europe call 2021, where it was binding to uh, give some of the money uh, of, the, of the project budget to museums, to small, medium-sized museums in the area of like 30,000 euros per museum. So that would be an excellent way of starting because you have your small budget and you are already included in a, uh, in a larger project. I listed here uh, three, the three projects that uh, are currently uh, running uh, using the money of this call. So for you uh, to, to have a look to see what was funded. Uh, Creative Europe, as I was saying, is the other typical uh, funding strand that cultural organizations uh, turn to. Um, it is made up of two sub-programs, culture and media. Um, it provides financial support for the transnational mobility, capacity building, circulation of art, artists, cultural workers, and audience development. And the new program uh, is oriented towards the new commission priorities. So focusing on greening, gender equality, social inclusion, and a stronger international dimension. And there are three different ways. You can go for a small scale project, a medium scale project, large scale project with less or more partners, and of course, less or more money. 
What is new in Creative Europe? Well, there is one uh, mobility scheme, which is quite interesting, which was um, experimented, it was on trial, and then it became uh, a stable uh, component of Creative Europe, which is iPortunus, and you can actually uh, find more information on, on the website of iPortunus. It's a mobility sc scheme mainly for artists, but also for cultural professionals uh, to move, to go on mobility, to go to other countries, uh, to, to train, to, to create also. The Creative Innovation Labs are also um, new, uh, which in incentivize players from uh, cultural and creative sectors to design and test innovative digital solutions. And then I, I wanted to mention this special call to support Ukrainian displaced people and the Ukrainian cultural and creative sectors, because although the, the European programs are stable, so in, in a sense, and, and this is what some of my colleagues see as a real uh, plus, is that you, you don't, you, you're not going to be surprised and not so much. I mean, for seven years, you know uh, pretty much what's going to be, uh, which calls are going to be uh, uh, launched every year, which priorities are there, they are stable. Nevertheless, uh, now and then there are new calls uh, which, which respond to new needs. Uh, and for instance, some years ago, there was a special call uh, for <clears throat> cultural projects involving migrants and refugees. And last year, September 2022, there was this special call uh, to support Ukraine. Um, And then we come to Erasmus Plus, and we will devote the last part of this conversation to Erasmus Plus, which is the, the EU flagship program for education, formal and informal, and for training. And it covers five different fields. We're all familiar with Erasmus, uh, thinking of university students, but in fact, Erasmus Plus uh, covers also school education, so school teachers, vocational education and training, higher education, so universities, adult education, so lifelong learn learning, and youth. Um, and uh, there are three main actions uh, in Erasmus Plus. Um, key activity one uh, focuses on mobility projects. I mean, we're going to go deep into this. Huh? Uh, so funds are given to go uh, abroad to, to uh, take part in courses and training to do job shadowing. Uh, key activity two. Um, uh, places emphasis on organizational cooperation and partnership. So you will find a cooperation uh, projects funded by key activity two strategic partnerships. Also sector skills alliances, which are transnational projects aimed at identifying skill gaps in a specific sector and designing and delivering training programs to rectify the situation. And then key three, uh, activity three, uh, to support policy cooperation at European level. Uh, I, I mentioned, and I will stop on this for a second, um, the charter project, because NEMO is a partner in it. This is a sector skills alliance. Um, it was a, a sector skills alliance project. It was funded by the sector skills alliance uh, funding strand of Erasmus Plus. And uh, it is quite a complex uh, project, which uh, will last four years, will end at the end of 2024, and wants to, as I was mentioning before, uh, uh, fill this gap between the education uh, sector, the training sector, and the skills of cultural heritage professionals. So it main objective is that of creative an alliance to make sure that cultural heritage professionals are provided with the skills they need now and, and in the future. Uh, but we want to make it simple or simpler, especially for those uh, who are just now starting to get interested in, uh, in uh, European projects. And so um, we want to mention the uh, small scale and the projects that are funded, the cooperation projects that are funded uh, by national agencies, because until I think the previous or maybe the, the also the, the, the pre-previous uh, funding program, uh, all Erasmus Plus uh, projects were funded um, at a European level. So they were, so to say, centralized actions. All application, applications were, uh, will go to Brussels. <clears throat> now, more recently, uh, applications go to the national, to the Erasmus Plus uh, national agencies, and they are uh, assessed um, at 
national level, uh, which means, uh, I mean, there are pros and cons, of course. Uh, it means that uh, your competition is at national level. Um, the, uh, the coordinator, the application is submitted to the national agency of the coordinator of the project. So the lead partner submits the application to its national agency. <clears throat> the pros are that if you start and if you want to start small, which is always advisable, you have, uh, um, say, um, a partner, your national agency, to whom you can turn and, and you can speak to uh, in your national language. So there are surely uh, benefits um, from, this, uh, from this scheme. And... Uh, <clears throat> So now we, we want to, uh, with the help of Evelyn, who's very experienced in, the, in this, and, and she's very active in, in programs, in Erasmus uh, Plus uh, programs that are brand new. So she's, uh, she has a lot of knowledge. We want to focus on mobility projects and cooperation projects of Erasmus Plus, which are funded at, at local level, uh, at local national, actually. Uh, why? Because uh, starting small is always a good idea. Starting small uh, gives you the opportunity of testing, of uh, seeing how a, a European project works, but with, not with the responsibilities of the coordinator. In Erasmus Plus uh, projects and programs, there are always learning components. So the learning component is good when you start and you go on mobility or you can build mobility into your project, which is for me an excellent way of learning from peers. So I stop here and I give the floor uh, to Evelyn, who will lead us through these uh, new functionalities and opportunities offered, uh, especially to small organizations or medium-sized organizations by the Erasmus uh, Plus program. Eleni, uh, Evelyn, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Margarita. <clears throat> I hope Evelyn, everyone can hear me well. Um, I will do it very short and, and concise, hopefully, before we two start to talk a little bit about uh, what we do in my organization. Uh, and please allow me a very personal view on this, uh, which comes from my personal engagement for many years in European networking. Um, I will, what I will talk about is, Margarita mentioned this, uh, the most access accessible branch of the Erasmus Plus project tree. It's the key action one called personal mobility for learners and staff in adult education. Um, we we uh, see ourselves in the museums as part of lifelong learning and adult education. And it, it was, to be honest, quite new when we started with our projects um, for the national agency to work with a museum overhead organization and with museums uh, in general. <clears throat> um, this is one of these very many branches of Erasmus Plus, and in my opinion, it's in fact uh, the best way to start to learn how things can work when you make EU projects, when you are part of an EU project, because it's 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 quite simple and easy to understand if you if you uh, are a little bit deeper inside. Well, first of all, I will do my personal organizational check as you should do it at the beginning of a project, showing you who is behind uh, this, what I'm talking about. Then uh, let me give you a picture of what my organization reached within the last eight years working with Erasmus Plus. Uh, and finally, um, also already within, in, in conversation with Margarita, I will give you a short insight of the experiences of how we, how we make it, um, how we organize it, who, with whom we work together, and we do it very, very practically. And everything has to be very simple and clear for us because of the structure of our organization. Um, MUSIS, the Styrian Museum Organization, is an independent regional organization existing for 30 years now. Uh, and it was more or less a help to help our self-organization at the beginning. Uh, we are working with and for the museums in the province of Styria, uh, basically, but we already started years ago also to cooperate and work for other museums in Austria as well. Uh, we are not publicly funded, if not, uh, we, we get a very, very small support of uh, some, some thousand euro, uh, but therefore, 
we have to work in the project scene more or less from the beginning on. Um, uh, we have a very small structure. That is just me and just recently one colleague and we are both in part time and all in all we have more or less 43 hours a week officially to work and I say very consciousnessly officially because uh, it's when when you are enthusiastic for something sometimes you you lose your uh, uh, your view to the watcher to the to your to your the hours that you have already worked on. Um, we have in our organization also a supporting structure, which comes from a job placement project that we do together for many years already with the job placement agency and the provincial government in Styria. And we have uh, people there coming for each of them for half a year uh, and support us on their way to the first uh, uh, job market. But it's very, very helpful because without them and without the three so-called key workers for this project, um, many, many things could not happen because in these few hours that they support us, uh, they can do things um, that are the, the simpler things, let's say. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> um, our experience go back to uh, the former framework before 2014. And at that time, adult education programs uh, that are now in Erasmus Plus uh, were called Grundvik projects. And at that time we started um, using the, the opportun opportunity to go abroad to learn as single persons uh, in personal mobility learning projects. There were no projects, but there were the, the, the offer to go alone to a partner organization, to a training, whatever, all around Europe. And then it changed in 2014. And um, at that time, it was me thinking about how uh, could we, as a, such a small organization, still be part of this system and, and uh, um, get, get some support of this European learning and also let our European network grow through this, uh, these opportunities. Um, well, and we started in 2015 uh, when I wrote an application, uh, but not just for us, because it was, I, I, I always think it, it's more meaningful to use my time for more people than just for one or two. Uh, and so I decided to ask three museums uh, in Styria, in our province, if they would like uh, to cooperate with me uh, in, for such a project and being partners in a consortium where we as Muses could be the leaders of. Well, um, it worked quite well with just nine persons uh, uh, doing trainings abroad you know, in Europe or uh, visiting colleagues in institutions in so-called job shadowings. Job shadowing means that you can go to a partner institution, you're hosted there by a partner institution, and either you stay there for one week, for two weeks, and shadow their work there, exchange, learn, um, or you, you are hosted there and you have the opportunity also to move around a little bit and to see other institutions in, during this time, uh, to, making, to make most of this time. Well, uh, for museums, this is, in my opinion, the most interesting opportunity using this KA1. Uh, well, and uh, what happened during the next years? It was quite successful this first year. In the second year, uh, we had already five consortium partners and then Austrian museums asked me when I presented this project in an Austrian museum conference if it would be possible for them also to take part because they don't have the structure and enough um, stuff also to apply for such a project. I am convinced it would be possible, but nevertheless, it, it, it had an added value for us to say, yes, we try this because it made for us and also for all the other participants in this network project um, to, to create a new um, European-minded network in the museum scene in Austria. And uh, step by step from year to year between 2016 and the application in 2020, um, we grew. And all in all, in these years, uh, we reached 
32 different consortium partners in Austria. So some of them um, are already for the fourth or uh, fifth time as a partner in the project. And more than 200 educators, mediators, curators, but also trainers or advisors uh, with uh, from little, uh, little um, uh, independent companies. So we included whoever was interested in as an institution and also uh, always looking at who could be inter uh, interesting for this, this uh, European minded network in Austria. Uh, well, this project 2020, I don't have to mention it really was more than a challenge uh because uh it was it, it should last for 15 months it lasts nearly three years but it was one of the most successful and just yesterday we got the message that it's one of the the few best practice examples in austrian adult education erasmus plus uh ka1 because of the structure because of how we uh, run it and how we solve the problems that we're in and we were really just two of us uh, to organize all this during these three years it was quite a challenge. Uh, well, and uh, when the new framework started in the year 21, uh, 21, yeah, uh, 21, uh, a new, new rules came into Erasmus Plus. Many things changed, and you know, we are uh, one is always a little bit afraid of things getting com more complicated than they were. But uh, it's really not like this. Um, we, we have the impression that uh, all the responsible bodies uh, in, in, in the European Union, in Brussels, the, the decision makers really try to make uh, things accessible, projects accessible. And so Erasmus Plus became, in my opinion, as a small consortium leader, um, more logic, more uh, controlled in the best way, um, and easier to access. Um, we just, uh, so to make it short, uh, since 21, you don't, uh, yeah, you have two possibilities to apply for an Erasmus Plus project. I am talking about K uh, K this KA1 mobility project. Either you apply as a new newcoming uh, institution, trying it for the first or second time, applying for a small scale project up to 35 mobilities. And you can just do this for your own organization, not as a consortium. The other possibility, and this is what we did and what we do, is to apply for a so-called accreditation. It means um, that you apply for three, four or five years uh, for one main concept, one idea behind um, and more or less three goals that you want um, to reach after having run uh, the number of projects that are in these application years. In our case, we applied in 21 uh, for, uh, um, uh, for, for the period till 26, for all in all four projects, not for six projects, just for four, because uh, learning from uh, uh, this 2020 project, which was really huge with 52 mobilities from 17 institutions, we said, okay, um, it doesn't make sense uh, to, to kill ourselves and to do it every year. We do it in a proper way. We do it well, four projects in six years. Um, the big difference is that you just have to write one big application. You just have to find one, um, a, 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 one good concept and good goals that you want to reach. And then every other year, uh, when you start with your projects, you just have to apply for the money that you will get. You just tell, uh, um, via a, a, a form in the web. This year we do 30 mobilities. And um, when we started, it was, uh, we had to, to apply very detailed. We 
we had to tell them how many people from which organization in the consortium will be part of. Now you just tell them this number of consortium partners, this number of people, you don't have to tell where you really want to go, how long you want to go, uh, just how long you want to go. But um, uh, the calculation of the lump sums you get for the travel um, is done by, uh, it's not done in your application, but it's done behind and you get uh, the budget, um, you, the information about the, uh, the, uh, the sum of your budget, and then you can calculate and organize in a very, very open way. So it's incredibly more easy than it was before if you do such uh, um, an, an accreditation. And we are really, really glad about that. Well, um, we just start with our first project now with 25 mobilities to learn how it works. Um, and we are really looking forward. Well, let, let me do a little jump to uh, one of the duties that we have to fulfill. And we, uh, as in all other uh, European projects, um, you have um, to grant a very good communication within the project, with all the partners, with all the consortium partners, and also the partners uh, on the other side, in our case, our hosting partners. Uh, you always have to provide a good dissemination uh, scheme, a good dissemination concept. And um, small as we are, this is not so easy, um, but we decided, first of all, to include Erasmus Plus in our website of the organization. Um, and we have uh, information of every project here. And after the end of the project year, um, we put the reports that we require of our participants or our participant teams. Um, this is like we organize it. It's not uh, uh, obligatory um, from side of Erasmus Plus. We want this to, to, to make the connection a little bit closer uh, between all the partners that we have in Austria. So we get the reports, the reports get uh, get on the website. And on the other hand side, we have a closed Erasmus, uh, Erasmus Plus Facebook group. You can imagine not all of the participants are at Facebook, but most of them. And as it's a closed group, nobody will see what we post there. But it was a simple possibility to find a communication tool uh, from on spot. So when, when our colleagues are on spot, example in Helsinki, um, uh, they report uh, more or less life, what they see, what they do, whom they meet. Uh, and at the end, we, we take all their reports together and make a little report out of it for each and every group or each and every uh, traveling person. This is everything is done in a very, very simple way because we don't have the resources to do it in another way. There would be a very good tool from, from the EU um, which is for adult education. It's so now I talk too quickly. It's a communication tool, um, but it was too. Uh, I tried to implement this, but it was absolutely too complicated for our consortium partners and participants to learn another communication tool. <clears throat> and so we still make it via Facebook. Um, oh well. Um, what else did I want to tell you? Um, yes, perhaps one, one interesting thing. Uh, we started with mobilities, uh, solo mobilities, so people could say, we, uh, I, I want to be part of, of the project. I am interested in this or that museum or this or that uh, 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 training uh, that, that, is, that is offered in wherever. Um, and they could go there. But step by step, we tried uh, not just to, to gain a European added value, but also an Austrian added value. And so we decided with a project 2020 to form little travel teams, um, learning teams, uh, but not from the same institution as we have a lot of institutions in the project. Uh, we asked them, and, and we also pre-selected our uh, hosting partners, um, knowing, or, or, or uh, because of, 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 of my personal European network and network of very close together working uh, colleagues, um, we 
could find or, or we, we, we can define the best hosting partners to reach our goals. Uh, and the last project um, had the theme storytelling and storytelling is a very special thing. And so uh, we were very conscious that it makes sense to pre-select the partners and not to travel anywhere. Um, and we formed little groups together from museums that have not yet worked together up to now. And this added value came out to be very, very high for the Austrian museum scene taking part in our project. And so we will go on like this. For our four year uh, four project application now in the accreditation system, uh, our goal is to implement the 17 SDGs, the strength, uh, other um, sustainability goals of the United Nations in museum work. Um, this is something that Austrian museums work on for two or three years now, and we want to support this. And also, this is an issue where it makes absolutely sense to pre-select the hosting partners because um, we want to, uh, to, 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 to gain a mutual effect, a mutual a, a real mutual effect in all institutions that take part, hosting and learning. Um, well, I, I end now here with, uh, with, with the special projects that we do. I just wanted to tell you from our point of view, uh, what are the very, very helpful features that are provided uh, by the EU? This is, first of all, a very well-written program guide of Erasmus+. Plus which is always open on my screen because there are always things in that I have to look at. Um, you find, before all, you find the priorities Margarita already mentioned and um, well, telling you some, uh, some words about these priorities. Um, being a museum and working in the museum scene it's really not difficult to meet the priorities, um, mostly after the new museum definition since 22 that, that we have now, because uh, all the priorities in this framework fit absolutely perfectly to what museum work should be, is now and should be in future. And so reaching the priorities in an application is really not difficult. The better you reach, the better you, 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 you write it down and the better you communicate it within um, uh, the group that you work with, uh, the, the consortium or your, your learners in, in your country um, or in your organization, the better. But this is not hindering an application for the museum scene, in contrary. Something very new is the so-called beneficiary tool. In the former framework, uh, it was called mobility tool and it was nothing more than uh, an online based data collection for your very project. For each and every person, uh, for every mobility, every hosting partner. And in this uh, mobility tool, you also had to finish your final report uh, and but you were very um, self-organized in this between uh, the starting point and the end date when you had to uh, to transfer your your final report. The beneficiary tool is not very different in terms of what you feed in, but uh, it's in the meantime uh, a kind of controlling system because you are more or less a little bit forced to do all these things in time. So when your first mobility starts, you, are, you, uh, you have the duty to put all these data in time in. Yeah? It's, it's a in itself controlling system. And this is very helpful not to have a huge workload at the end or not to lose your control over the project because it is in fact uh, one of the most crucial things to keep track, keep it simple, but to keep in, in track, to, to have the overview during the project, mostly if you are a small institution, just doing this beside all your other duties. So the beneficiary tool seems to me very good, very well done, 
very intelligent and I think it works already. Um, we, we haven't yet uh, put any data in because we are right uh, we, we are right now starting with the first project um, where we use the beneficiary tool. Um, uh, and it didn't, you know, always when a new framework starts, the technical things last a little bit longer uh, to really to, to work well. But now it works absolutely well. And, and I'm a great fan of it. Uh, and yeah, Margarita mentioned it. It's really helpful to work closely together with the national agency. And in terms of Austria, I just can't say they are the most helpful people uh, in any question. And they had a lot of difficult questions to answer and challenges to solve with us together during the corona, the, the pandemic period, uh, because many, many things came differently as they were planned. And it was absolutely supportive and 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 fantastic to work. So, I, I, just address your national agency, and you will be glad, and you will be more keen and and uh, um, more sure about what you can do, because they will will really help you. Perhaps I will stop here, Margarita, and we can start to talk a little bit yes. about all the other things. <laughs> Yes, especially, and especially I would like to, to answer some of the questions that came from the audience. But we, before we do, I would just like to underline a couple of, of things that you said. Um, and you, not now, but, but when we chatted to prepare this webinar, you also mentioned that uh, through mobility, it is possible to invite experts. To exactly. come to you. So yeah. you're not only sending out people. So there is a lot that the term mobility covers. You can go on preparatory visits. You can invite experts to come to your organization. You can send your own staff. And Evelyn gave a wonderful example of how these Erasmus Plus uh, projects are not only for um, standalone organizations, but very useful also for networks or museum associations, such as mm -hmm. the Syrian Museum uh, Association, because they benefit. There is this uh, cascading and multiplying effect. So it's in order to, as you said, to 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 build this uh, this European network, uh, uh, this European minded network of, of professionals. Mm -hmm. found great. The other thing I wanted to mention is that. Uh, now, uh, not for mobility projects, but for uh, small cooperation projects, uh, there is really an incentive for newcomers. Um, mm -hmm. And that I read in, in the guidelines that newcomers are sort of like prioritized. There is an effort of the agencies to open up to new organizations and make them experience what it is like to be in a European partnership uh, with just another partner. So there are small partnerships, just you know, two partners, two countries. So I stop here, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm asking the, uh, the colleagues uh, who support us for this webinar, whether, um, whether there are questions that we cannot uh, avoid. So very urgent questions. I mean, myself, I'm, I'm ready to stay for, for any question. Um, okay. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you, Evelyn and Margarita, for this very insightful presentation. And uh, I have asked in the chat for people to, to write their questions. So while they are typing, which I can see that someone is doing, then I would just like to thank you again. And maybe I can ask a question in the meantime, uh, Margarita, about the if, if an organization would like to get involved in a bigger project, you did suggest at first get involved as an associate partner or a minor pro uh, partner as one of the suggestions. And how could and how could someone find those kinds of opportunities? Um, well, I mean, uh, there is the partner search. I mean, there is also the possibility of writing up your wish list, so to say. I'm an organization of this kind. I would like to participate. That's however not maybe not so fruitful it, it's it's difficult i think it all comes with um being involved in conversations with colleagues 
um, and, and finding out which are the, the topics of common interest. And, and so it takes, it takes time. I mean, in the, in the toolkit, we have also testimonials of, of people. I'm, I'm thinking of the Maritime, of a Maritime Museum, which is very active in uh, projects with other Maritime uh, museums in Europe. And he says it took him about 10 years <laughs> to really build this network. I wouldn't say 10, but, you know, a few years at least. So, and associate partnership is not very, uh, I mean, it's, it's not so convenient in the sense that you don't receive money, but you don't do anything. You don't have to do anything, but you don't receive money. So I would rather go for a minor uh, part in a larger project. Like in one of my projects, in the project, one of the projects I coordinated years ago, we had one partner who said, we're just interested in taking part. So we just want the budget to travel and to come to partner meetings. That is all. And other partners had, had many more responsibilities, much more money. So that is also why well, that can always be negotiated. So that's Very my good. answer. Well, it looks like we have a question here that I'll read out for you. So thank you very much for all this information. It's very interesting and helpful. You said in order to apply and start a project, it is important to have a concept, an idea behind it and three goals. Could you please give an example to understand this better? Could it be a project on children's education or specific topic for a museum, for example? Thank you very much. So, Shall I answer? Uh, yeah, start oh, you. Please, I, I, I start. Of course, it can be on, on children's education, it can be on, on anything. Now, um, the, the, the idea is that everything should be very clear in your head, what you want to achieve and why, and, 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 and very clearly expressed for the evaluators who will read your application. This in very general terms. Uh, and of course, I'm available to continue this conversation also outside the webinar with maybe with example, with concrete examples of um, of applications that were that were uh, written and, and funded. But Evelyn, you wanted to say something. Yeah. Well, in in terms of Erasmus Plus, they have different branches. So adult education means really learning for adult people. But there are also other branches. There is youth. Uh, um, there is there is a pupil and so, sometimes um, uh, you can also co work together with uh, not museum institutions for such an application. However, you just have to take a close look to what branch you are in and what is is is, is the name of the program to fit in. So uh, so children's education just fits into uh, a program where also children's education is involved. Yes, yeah, yeah, and and I can remember. I mean, uh, um, the um, hands-on, uh, the uh, International Organization of Children uh, Museums is the lead partner of. Uh, I'm, I'm now thinking of a Creative Europe uh, project. So just moving away because indeed Erasmus Plus is uh, for the for the uh, the strand that we have been discussing is concerned more with adult education. So you have to bend. Your, but for children's education, you can uh, probably turn to other uh, mm -hmm. funding uh, sources and, and Creative Europe is one. And I'm very aware of this recent project where hands-on, which is, as I said, the Association, International Association of Children's Museums is the, the, is the lead partner. So yep. thank you. I hope that answers your question. And um, since I see someone is still typing, I could ask maybe Evelyn because, oh. Yeah. Um, Evelyn, you wrote a message that you were already asking people to get in touch if they want to collaborate in the next few years. Does that only apply to museums who are your members uh, or do they have to be in Austria? to be able no, to be part of this. No, I mean, it, it, I'm always very interested in finding new hosting partners all over Europe. Yeah, <laughs> <perfect>. <laughs> a colleague from Bursa is here, for example, or from Norway. These are countries where we haven't yet been. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so it, it, it would be really, really great to get in touch with new hosting partners all over Europe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, very welcome. <laughs> 
Yeah, when we close this webinar, which we will wrap it up now quite soon, uh, you will be uh, uh, redirected to a page with contact information to Evelyn in case you are interested to be one of the partners in this project. And I think with those words, uh, we would uh, wrap this up. And I thank you so much, Evelyn and Margarita, for taking the time to uh, to uh, explain this topic to us. It's very complex, but I think everyone now has a bit more of understanding of it all. So thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure.